Okay, welcome. This is our uh, lecture 1-5 and in this we're going to take a closer look at the celestial sphere. Um, our objectives are as follows. Uh, I want you to see how the night sky is mapped in uh, more of a three-dimensional aspect than the two-dimensional star finders and some of the pictures and graphs that we've looked at. Uh, we'll take a peek at how asterisms are used for um, a more specific navigation of the night sky than just the basic bouncing around that we've used of like, hey, here's the pointer stars to Polaris to the Little Dipper and then Arc to Arcturus and kind of using that as a jumping off spot. And uh, there's a bit of review on uh, latitude and longitude, which are obviously associated with maps and globes. And then we'll see how that uh, relates to this uh, three-dimensional night sky map. So uh, the term celestial sphere, you've heard it, I've used it, but we're going to look at it in more detail today. Um, basically what the celestial sphere is, is it's a pretend shell around the earth that you could plot stars on. And uh, it's basically just like this clear globe over the globe. So uh, looking at the picture here that I uh, scanned in from our text, um, in the center there, that's earth. And that little yellow circle, little yellow sphere there, that's supposed to be the sun. And then you see that kind of like bluish, it almost looks like a bubble around the earth. That's supposed to represent the celestial sphere. Or uh, here is an actual celestial sphere. So you can see the globe that's kind of encapsulated or, uh, you know, surrounded by that clear outer shell that's got what appears to be like a bunch of lines running all over it and different dots. Um, we're going to get uh, more and more familiar with that. But this is a celestial sphere. So you can kind of think of it as like a globe over a globe. Um, keep in mind, when you're looking at this, you're looking at the celestial sphere from the outside in. Uh, we live on Earth, and we're observers from Earth. So you want to always keep that in mind that, you know, even though this is a celestial sphere and you could just hold it in your hand, um, you're viewing from the Earth's surface out into space. So uh, the way you would orientate an actual celestial sphere um, takes that into consideration. So uh, the term asterism and constellation. Those are terms that we should be familiar with as well. Uh, just to regroup or uh, review real quickly, um, an asterism, it's the group of stars. So like if we looked at Canis Major or, you know, the, the big dog that's easily found from following, uh, you know, Orion's belt down, that's an asterism. It's a group of stars. And a lot of times, um, I'll do this myself, you know, you use the term constellation instead of when you really mean asterism. Um, technically, a constellation is an area of space. And uh, if we took that celestial sphere that we just saw and we counted up all these chunks that are made up or all these constellations that make up that shell, there'd be 88 of them. So it's a lot like if you were looking at a map of Michigan and you, know, you saw all the lines that represent the different counties that break up Michigan. Think of space as being busted up by these chunks that are constellations. So in the picture here, that looks a lot like a road map or, you know, a map of uh, Michigan or, or, you know, basically with like the lines kind of drawing where the uh, different breaks would be. Um, what we see here is the constellation Orion. And uh, you can see that it's got that kind of like odd, almost sort of like reverse, I don't know, like a little lobster claw kind of shape to it there. That solid line there that represents a region of space called Orion. And that's pretty helpful because uh, astronomers could just say, look to Orion. And other astronomers, regardless of where they're at on the globe, they've got a ballpark way of looking into that region of space. We'll see they can fine-tune it a lot more than just a ballpark. But um, it's a lot like if I said, oh, it's over by California. You know to at least kind of orientate your view to the western side of the United States. Even though if I said, oh, it's by California, and you were to get in your car and drive out that way, it wouldn't be real precise uh, directions. Um, we can get very, very precise, though, with this celestial sphere and the way we navigate it. So uh, sometimes there are constellations that are named for the major asterism in them. 
which is another way of saying sometimes a region of space is named for the main group of stars there. So like, for example, the constellation Orion is named after the asterism Orion. So the, the main group of stars that you see in this region of space is the asterism Orion. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like if, uh, you know, you've got some states that uh, have, um, you know, the, the major city named after that state, like New York, New York. Uh, Orion, Orion is a location in a location or a group of stars within that location. Uh, taking a peek at Orion here again, just a little bit of review. You see those three stars there that makes up the belt. And we could follow it down to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, um, oftentimes referred to as the dog star because it's in Canis Major, the big dog asterism. There's Rigel, that nice bright star that makes up like Orion's um, foot. And then uh, one of his shoulder stars, uh, Betelgeuse, which actually means armpit of the giant. Notice it's got that reddish tinge to it. It's a red supergiant, um, very, very large, uh, relatively cool, giving it the reddish color. Whereas if we look at Rigel, that's a very, very hot star. That's why it's got that bright white color to it. Uh, you can kind of make out in the front here. Orion's shield. Um, some drawings or sketches where they kind of fill this in shows Orion holding like a bear cloth. Um, and then we've got, you know, Aldebaran. That's the red eye of Taurus the bull making up this little V shape here. And, uh, you know, we've bounced around from those before. But uh, without too much review, let's uh, continue to move forward. So the celestial sphere. Um, it's a shell around a globe and if I were to measure a distance from the globe to the shell it's the same in all directions. Um, we've got the stars that we would see from the Earth's surface drawn on or plotted on that pretend shell. Um, keep in mind not all stars are the exact same distance from the Earth. Uh, there's a huge difference from distance to distance from star to star. So what we see here is uh, an asterism that you would uh, see. It's pretty common if you get into the uh, southern hemisphere. So, you know, like the star finder that we made and worked with, um, that was northern hemisphere stars. But anyways, you know, you can see where this little picture here where they've drawn in the cross. Uh, this is how you would view that from space. And if I'm a viewer on Earth and I look up at the stars, it looks like they're all about the same distance from each other. Or it's like they're kind of painted on a two-dimensional surface, um, like the celestial sphere. But realistically, if I were to get in a spaceship and try to check out this group of stars, the distance from star to star could be crazy huge. So you're looking at it almost as if it is painted on a two-dimensional surface, like the celestial sphere. But again, keep in mind, space is three-dimensional, right? And those stars could be huge distances from each other. It's a lot like if I were on a, um, standing on a straight, long, long, long road, and it's nighttime, and two cars were coming at me with their headlights on, and I look down the road and I see those headlights, it might look like those cars are close to each other or kind of side by side, when in reality, as they get closer... I'd see that there could be a huge difference in where those cars were on the road, or they might not be necessarily side by side. So when we see these stars in the night, and it looks like they're all just kind of almost painted on a shell, um, that's not actually the case. There could, again, be colossal differences in distance from one star to the next. So this is something you got to keep in mind when you're looking at the celestial sphere. Uh, just because a star looks like it's right next to the, its neighbor, um, in reality, that could be a huge distance. So um, when we talk about stars, and, uh, you know, we've looked before how I was saying that, you know, well, the stars, um, they're not actually moving throughout the night sky. It's just an effect of the Earth's rotation. And the stars, they're not really moving throughout our revolution or our path around the sun. And those things are true. But if stars are actually moving, if the whole universe is expanding, um, how come we don't see that? 
And the reason being is they're so far away that um, it would take a very, very, very long time for us to notice the difference in the star's locations. It's kind of like um, if I'm standing on the ground, well, I'm on the ground or the Earth's surface, and I look up and I see an airplane way up in the sky, and I watch that airplane. And if I were to like kind of measure in the sky how far that airplane moved in, say, a second or two, it might look like from my perspective on the Earth's surface, it might look like that airplane's only traveled a couple of inches in the sky. I know that airplane's traveling a heck of a lot faster than a couple of inches per second. So imagine then the distance from the Earth's surface to these stars. That's like crazy exaggerated example of that. So the picture here actually shows what the Big Dipper will look like 100,000 years into the future. And you can see those little vector arrows. They're showing the direction that the stars are traveling in relationship to each other. So things are changing. It's just a lot of it is going to take so long to change that a human lifetime probably won't notice it. Unless you live to be very, very old or figure out a way to travel through time. So the celestial sphere, um, you know, are all stars the exact same distance from the Earth's surface? No, they're not. Uh, another thing, if you look at the Earth and Sun size and the Earth and Sun movement here, it's not accurate from the way the solar system actually works. So why would they do that? And reason being is the celestial sphere isn't trying to accurately map the solar system. It's trying to say, hey, from the Earth's surface, this is how you would view the night sky. So the Earth is substantially smaller than the sun. And uh, we'll get more into that with scale in a bit. Um, and keep in mind, too, that the Earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. So we've got the size here wrong. And we've got the movement here wrong. But, you know, as a viewer from Earth, if I look up and I see the sun, I mean, don't stare at the sun in the, in the day sky. But if I were to measure the size of the sun, it's the exact same size as the moon. And I know the moon's smaller than the Earth and the sun's bigger than the moon, or excuse me, than, well, the sun's bigger than the moon and the Earth. Um, that's, you know, the way it's viewed from our perspective. Uh, if I watch the sun, Again, don't stare at the sun, but if I watch the sun throughout the course of the day, I see it rise somewhere off in the east and set somewhere off in the west. That's not actually what's taking place, but the Earth's rotation gives it that appearance. So again, the celestial sphere, awesome at what it does, but it's not a, a true model of the solar system and its movements and scales. So how do we start to break up this celestial sphere? Um, generally, we start with what's referred to as the celestial equator. And, uh, you know, if you look at the picture here, you see the Earth's equator, that white line, equator, equal. It's going to break the Earth into equal halves. Um, in this case, a northern and a southern hemisphere, or top and a bottom. And if you were to project that out onto the celestial sphere, we call that the celestial equator. So uh, there are poles, the North Pole and the South Pole on the Earth. If you were to extend that out onto the celestial sphere, we've got what's referred to as the North and South Celestial Pole. So no difference there, right? I mean, between like a globe, you should be kind of familiar with a globe or a map where you've got North and South Pole. And in the equal in the middle there, you've got the equator. I mean, if we use the you know term celestial equator, celestial north pole, or celestial south pole, that would be just where they projected out into the celestial sphere. So there's a grid system that's very similar to latitude and longitude, but it's got a different term or terms. Uh, latitude is what's referred to as declination. And longitude is what's referred to as right ascension. So declination is like the latitude. And I get where, you know, you're probably just hearing maybe for the first time terms like declination and right ascension. The way I used to keep them straight is I was like, all right, I know one's like latitude. And I used to think like, okay, if I had to um, abbreviate latitude, I would abbreviate it L-A-T. And if I had to abbreviate declination, 
I would abbreviate it DEC, whereas, you know, longitude, right ascension, okay, well, those wouldn't be like three letters, three letters, latitude, three letters, declination, three letters. I don't know. It's a little trick. Maybe it'll help you keep those straight, like for which is which. And just like latitude um, runs from zero degrees to 90 degrees north or zero degrees to 90 degrees south, um, so does declination. Declination just basically means like how far above. And you've got a zero to a 90 degrees, just like the systems or the coordinates of latitude work. Longitude, it's referred to as right ascension. And that's because the sun rises in the east or it ascends in the east, which would be to your right. So right ascension is a fancy way of saying that. And since we're talking about the sun rising and setting, we go from zero to 24 hours, a full rotation or a full day. So uh, if you're still a little confused on even latitude and longitude, um, a little trick I used to use when I was a kid, I used to think, all right, longitude, I'm longer standing up and down. So that would mean that lines of longitude run up and down. And uh, latitude, I used to think, well, lat rhymes with fat. You get fat around your belly, and my belly runs side to side. So uh, maybe those are tricks, or perhaps you just know latitude and longitude well, which is fantastic. Now we're just saying, all right, well, there's this declination and right ascension system for the celestial sphere that uh, we can use to uh, get really specific with all that. So on a globe, the prime meridian, or what would be zero degrees longitude, uh, runs through Greenwich, England, and uh, that's because a uh, king of England basically commissioned to have a coordinate system for the globe uh, put into place. They said, well, we came up with this, or we paid to have this done. Let's start it through here. It doesn't have to, but anyways, zero degrees longitude is what's referred to as the prime meridian. Right ascension starts at a spot that we're going to look at in a lot more detail later called the vernal equinox. That's a fancy way of saying the first day of spring. So that's going to be a place where the sun intersects the celestial equator. And uh, if we were to look at this, you've got the celestial equator. And the sun sometimes travels above it and sometimes travels below it. And there's going to be two points where the sun's path intersects the celestial equator. One is right here on the picture, the vernal equinox, and that would be like our starting point. Uh, the other would be another equinox, but it's not the uh, spring equinox, it's the autumnal equinox, or the fancy way of saying the first day of fall. So here is, on the left, an actual celestial sphere. On the right, we just see all those lines of declination. You remember which one declination is? All right, is that like latitude or longitude? How would I abbreviate declination? Three letters, D-E-C. Oh yeah, latitude, I'd abbreviate that L-A-T. So these lines that run left to right or west to east or side to side, they're going to be parallels or parallel to each other. That's your declination. And your right ascension, these lines that run up and down like lines of longitude, those are going to be uh, your lines of right ascension. So this just stripped all that back and shows you those two side by side, the difference between lines of right ascension and the difference between lines of declination. A lot to throw at you. By no means would I expect somebody to listen to me, you know, rant about this for, what, you know, 15 minutes or so and then just, yep, got it all locked in my head. But like everything, you know, you practice it a little bit, you hear about it a little bit, you read about it a little bit. You work with it a little bit, and little by little, it starts to stick. Uh, if you've got specific questions, please let me know. Uh, hopefully you got something out of this. Until um, we meet again, take care.